Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the McPhail Center for Music. What a great way to start with music on a spring day. So we're glad you could be here. My name is Kyle Carpenter. I'm the chief executive officer here. We're delighted to be hosting this 2016 State of the City Address. Uh, we're pleased with all the distinguished guests we have here today. Uh, in particular, I would like to uh, welcome the council members who are here, our great third ward councilman, Jacob Fry. Thank you for being here today. President Barbara Johnson, and of course, our distinguished mayor, Betsy Hodges. For those of you who are not familiar with the McPhail Center for Music, I wanted to just take a minute or two to maybe convey some things you don't know about us. McPhail has been around for 109 years in this city, and we started by chance. Um, a young William McPhail, who was son of immigrants living right across the river from here, uh, woke up one morning at the age of seven and found a violin on his kitchen table. His father had won it the night before in a game of chance. Uh, half the family, the McPhail family, say it was a church raffle. The other half say it was a saloon poker game. <laughs> they argue that a bit. Nevertheless, this is a classic case of a Minnesota entrepreneur who followed his vision and created what is today the largest community music center in the country. So this is wonderful. <laughs> McPhail is a community music center. Um, we serve people of all ages, all backgrounds, and all abilities. We like to say that our youngest students are six weeks old, and our oldest student today is 104. And we carry our programs out through the community in a great way. We have five locations, this being our flagship, but also Apple Valley, White Bear Lake, Chanhassen, and most recently, Austin, Minnesota, first time outside of the Twin Cities. So those are physical sites that people can come to us for teaching and learning. But we also, uh, back in the probably mid-90s, created an approach called Community Partnerships where our programs and our teachers go out to the community to the points of greatest need and opportunity and deliver our programs there. This would be in early childhood centers, in schools, in retirement communities, in healthcare centers. And over 8,000 of our 15,000 students that we serve today are served through 105 partnerships. And most recently, we've started a very innovative approach using live online music teaching and learning. And we're doing that across the state of Minnesota, particularly to rural areas that have been hard hit by the arts education cutbacks, where there are few music educators left in many of the schools. Uh, it's been a great program for us. You know, we, we pride ourselves on creating an exceptional music learning experience for every individual uh, that comes to McPhail and that participates in our programs. Over half of our students receive some form of financial aid or subsidy or in a program that's subsidized. Uh, and it's just been a wonderful opportunity to extend our reach and our access across not only the Twin Cities, but the state of Minnesota. So with that, again, we're delighted that you could be here with us today. And it is now my honor to introduce to you uh, City Council President Barbara Johnson. Thank you so much, and I, I just want to point out that the city of Minneapolis was a partner in McPhail, with McPhail uh, in uh, uh, obtaining state bonding for this beautiful facility, so we're delighted to be here today. Uh, this is a adjourned meeting of the Minneapolis City Council, so I am going to call the city council meeting to order. So I'm going to ask our clerk, Mr. Casey Carl, to call the roll, and uh, as people's names are called, my colleague council members, if you would please stand up and be acknowledged, that would be great. Mr. Carl. Councilmember Proud. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Present. Councilmember Gordon. Here. Councilmember Cano. Here. Councilmember Wright. Present. Councilmember Bender. Here. Councilmember Glidden. Here. Councilmember Yang. Here. Councilmember Johnson. Here. Councilmember Quincy. Here. Council Member Orsami. Present. Council Member Goodman is absent. President Johnson. Here. There are 12 members present. 
Well, we have a quorum present. Councilmember Goodman has a family commitment today, so she won't be joining us. Uh, but it is my pleasure then today to introduce Mayor Betsy Hodges for her 2016 uh, State of the City Address. Mayor Hodges. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Carpenter, both for your words and for the use of this beautiful facility. Thank you, Council President Johnson, Council Vice President Glidden, and the City Council for allowing me to speak at your meeting. Um, and I would like to say a special thank you to my parents who are here in the second row. And a special thank you to my husband, who is standing in back. And again, thank you to all of you who, can, who are here, and a special thank you to everybody who's here on stage. Nobel Prize laureate and physicist Niels Bohr said this about his idea of a deep truth, a truth whose negation is also true. The opposite of a fact is a falsehood, but the opposite of one profound truth may very well be another profound truth. One of the many undersung assets right here in Minneapolis is the public radio program and podcast On Being, whose offices are on Loring Park. Recently, host Krista Tippett was talking with scientist Dr. Frank Wilczek. He said this about deep truth. You have to view the world in different ways to do it justice. And the different ways can each be very rich, can each be internally consistent, can each have its own language and rules, but they may be mutually incompatible. To do full justice to reality, you have to take both of them into account. This is relevant in science for something like light. It is true that light is a particle. It is also true that light is a wave. But we must research separately the properties of light when each of the, within each of those truths if we are to fully understand light as a whole. Deep truth is also a useful construct when thinking about ourselves as a people. In Minneapolis, we get to take into account two of our own complementary and deep truths. Minneapolis is a remarkable and wonderful city. And Minneapolis is a city of deep challenges, particularly regarding race. From this first set arises another set of deep truths about Minneapolis. We come together for the common good, and we strain to come together as people and are divided. And I posit this, that our ability to come together is our greatest strength, that it is the source of the best things about our community, and that when we do come together as one Minneapolis, there is no stopping us. Nowhere is there better evidence of this than the group assembled on stage here today. Each person sitting here, and again, thank you all for being here, each person sitting here is a community leader, a person who has made a measurable positive difference in the quality of our city. Let's thank them with our applause for all that they have done for me. More important, each leader on stage with me here today has successfully worked to get a good outcome with people with whom they disagree, sometimes including me. Each person on stage has pledged to a brighter future for all of us. Each person was willing to be here even though we haven't always agreed because they share a vision for a bigger, better future for Minneapolis. So we stand here together in the midst of these dualities. Minneapolis is a remarkable city. Minneapolis is a city of deep challenges. We come together for the common good. We strain to come together as people. These statements seem contradictory. All of them are true. And that duality, it is the state of our city. I must begin by addressing the very serious challenge we are facing in North Minneapolis right now. Gun violence is up sharply. The intensity of this violence is shocking and entirely unacceptable, and I condemn it. No resident in any neighborhood should have to endure this kind of violence. It has no place in North Minneapolis or anywhere in our city. 
to the people of North Minneapolis, especially those most affected by this gun violence, I say, I hear you and your city hears you. In response, Chief Janae Harteau has increased police presence and focused enforcement in known hotspots in North Minneapolis. As more officers join the force and we anticipate being at full authorized strength by mid-year, I have directed Chief Harteau to deploy the lion's share of new personnel to the 4th Precinct and the 1st Precinct. Minneapolis police officers have vitally important jobs to do all across our city, including in North Minneapolis. Chief Harteau has my support in her efforts to ensure that they are as productive and effective as possible in keeping people safe and in building trust. Chief Harteau has also focused on community policing, which I have supported in my budgets with the support of the council. In North Minneapolis, as across the city, this has meant officers spending more, times on call, more time on calls and more time getting to know people. Positive police contacts in the neighborhood are up 63% over last year and 231% over two years ago. The work of building community trust has a long-term deterrent effect on violence. The fact that we measure it at all is a sign that we have changed how we approach policing in Minneapolis. Another long-term way to deter violence is to keep people out of the criminal justice system to begin with. In the past 18 months, we have increased the number of juveniles involved in diversion, which has led to fewer youth entering the system. City Attorney Susan Siegel's office also is innovating to keep people from getting too far into the criminal justice system once they get there. Many organizations and individuals in our community are working hard to reach the youth and young adults involved in and affected by this violence. Faith leaders, community members, advocates, neighbors, and youth workers from Youth Violence Prevention and the Youth Coordinating Board. The YCB's youth outreach team is doing particularly great work. Whether downtown, in our schools or parks, or at special events, youth workers are reaching our young people where they are, connecting with them in meaningful ways, and making a difference in their lives, and therefore our lives. We have seen time and again that when community comes together, sometimes despite differences, to fight violence and lift up peace, safety, and healing, we are all safer. We at the city are continuing to identify ways to collaborate with and lift up this crucial work. It's been several tough emotional months in Minneapolis for all of us. The death of Jamara Clark on November 15th and the occupation of the 4th Precinct for 18 days after that was hard for everyone. Family members, demonstrators, neighbors, community members, police officers, it is true that police-community relationships have been in need of transformation since long before November 15th, especially in and for communities of color. Perhaps on no other issue have we been so divided from one another. It is also true that Minneapolis is leading the country on reforming and transforming police and police-community relations. We have been coming together with many partners to do much work on this front for a long time. Since I became mayor, I have been working to get body cameras on our officers, and in 2016, that will happen. As part of this work, we have sought out meaningful feedback from the community about our body cam policy, which we are currently taking into close consideration, and we will report the results back of that to the community. We are close to implementation on an early intervention system, and EIS is not disciplined. Rather, it is a tool to help officers who may be struggling to correct course before little problems become big problems. One of the best ways to build community trust is for officers to look like the community that they serve. To this end, I have funded more permanent classes of community service officers. The most recent class is 61% people of color. I thank Chief Harteau for the time she took to interview each candidate in that class personally. We are also significantly adding to officer training. By the end of last year, every Minneapolis police officer had received fair and impartial police training. In February, police officers began procedural justice training to improve the interaction between officers and residents. All will complete it this year. I thank Councilmember Blong Yang for partnering with me to fully fund the training and accelerate the implementation of it. By the end of this year, all patrol officers will have completed 40 hours of crisis intervention training, which will help them de-escalate situations that involve a mental health crisis. 
In addition, the police department is assessing policies and training around use of force to make sure that they are current and consistent with best practice standards. Finally, as many of you know, Minneapolis is one of only six cities in the country to participate in the groundbreaking national initiative for building community trust and justice. The national initiative has been on the ground for over a year in Minneapolis, working on the three pillars of reducing implicit bias, improving procedural justice, and promoting racial reconciliation. This work involves true partnership with community, and I am pleased that community leaders have embraced it and support it. It is also true that we have done and are doing much, and it is also true that there is much, much more to be done. And that in order for this work to succeed, community and government must enter into true partnership. Community-based organizations and advocates have brought forward a number of intriguing proposals for building trust at which I am looking closely and on which I am hoping we can partner. In the immediate aftermath of the fourth precinct occupation, Chief Harteau and I requested that the Department of Justice conduct an independent after-action review of the city's response to the fourth precinct occupation. We asked for this review because we need to know what went well and we need to know what could have gone better. We anticipate that report in the fall. As we move forward from those 18 days and into the future of transformed police community relationships, we can be proud that we as a people and a city are sticking with this difficult conversation around policing, community, and race. Engaging with each other, challenging each other, challenging me, listening to one another, carefully, respectfully. It is hard and it can be painful, but it is necessary and we will be a stronger city and better people for it. So thank you, all of you, for being part of it. Much of my State of the City speech last year was about the urgent need for inclusive growth. The idea that everybody must be able to contribute to and benefit from our growth and prosperity if we want to actually have ongoing growth and prosperity. It is no less urgent this year. It is great news to be celebrated that we are a fast-growing city. The Metropolitan Council has just announced that Minneapolis's population stands at, drumroll, 412,517 people, the highest in around 40 years. <laughs> this means we have added just under 30,000 residents since 2010 for nearly 8% growth in just six years. The news is just as great that we are a booming city. Last year, for the fourth year in a row, the value of our building permits topped $1 billion. This does not come from just one sector. This is a broad-based boom that we have here. So I will speak about three different components of growth, infrastructure, business, and jobs. It cannot be denied. Our infrastructure is the envy of many cities in this country. I met recently with a delegation from Nashville, a great city in and of itself. To them, our parks and our bikeways are a marvel. And why not? It's true. We are the number one park system in the country, right? That's right, you should applaud, we're awesome. We are not only the number one bike city in America, we are the number 18 bike city in the world, the only North, first and only North American city on that list. Yeah. And just look at the city that's rising up in front of us. The Wells Fargo Towers are up and open. There are cranes all over what used to be kind of a dead zone in downtown East. There's more construction on Hennepin Avenue that is soon to include the Nicollet Hotel block. The Midtown Greenway is flush with new housing. New hotels are going up in the North Loop and downtown East. The list goes on and on. The built environment of our city and the infrastructure that supports it are growing up and growing out rapidly. Yay us. And I look forward to a future Minneapolis that includes things like the downtown East Commons, when it opens later this year, it will be a jewel in the transformation of downtown East. Just imagine 
In a few months, you'll be able to walk out these doors from McPhail of this great venue and over to the Commons to enjoy a walk, a lunch, a game of bocce, or a concert. Thank you very much to Councilmember Jacob Fry and to Council President Barb Johnson for their partnership in turning this complex project into a reality for the city of Minneapolis. We'll have a beautiful new 29th Street that has been reclaimed for all users, a project that Councilmember Lisa Bender has shepherded and shepherded well. A wonderful example of transit-oriented development on 38th and Hiawatha, championed by Councilmember Andrew Johnson. A redesigned Nicollet Mall that will, will be a destination for the 21st century in and of itself. An Upper Harbor Terminal transformed into a world-class amenity for North Minneapolis, a vision that both Council President Barbara Johnson and I share. And we'll have a University and Avenue Innovation District that is a world-class jobs and research center and urban village, a vision that Councilmember Cam Gordon has moved forward for many years. And just weeks ago, the City Council, the Park Board, and I collaborated to pass an historic once-in-a-generation agreement to fund a good deal of the capital and operating needs of our city's streets and bridges and neighborhood parks for the next 20 years, transparently and equitably. And you may have noticed it was neither easy nor obvious. <laughs> I have long supported our park's need for long-term capital dollars, but earlier versions of the ordinance would have met the need for parks alone and left our streets for another day. However, we had already clearly laid out the urgent need for significant long-term capital investment in our streets before the cost of repairing them became unaffordable, frankly. And so I stood for a global solution that included $1 for parks for every $2 for streets and for sources of funding that are reliable in the long term. And I'm pleased that that's the agreement that we struck. Mm -hmm. We can be very proud that we came together unanimously to accept our responsibility to restore our parks and our streets to good shape for future generations. Many people deserve thanks for this resolution. The City Council as a whole, including my co-author John Quincy, the Park Board as a whole, and park advocates, including Mark Andrew, who is joining me here today. Thank you to everybody who made that possible. <laughs> also, more needs to be done, specifically by the state legislature. At a time when we here in Minneapolis have come together across jurisdictions and put real dollars on the table to fund our infrastructure needs sustainably, and when even Congress can come together to pass a long-term transportation bill, there is no excuse for the state legislature not to act and to act this year. I strongly support the efforts of Governor Mark Dayton, Senator Scott Dibble, and Representative Frank Hornstein to pass a comprehensive, long-term, sustainable roads and transit funding package that will allow us to meet our residents' many diverse needs. Our city's impressive growth could be choked off if our streets decay and our transit system remains inadequate. Business. Minneapolis, we have one of the most thriving business sectors anywhere. From our Fortune 500 companies to our startups, from our small businesses to our not-for-profits, from our restaurants, tap, and cocktail rooms to our many emerging social enterprises, we are diverse, resilient, and ever-expanding. Our business sector is not only thriving, it is community-oriented. I receive endless compliments from mayors around the country, and frankly, no small measure of jealousy, for our business community's civic-mindedness. They come together for countless acts of good for the city like the downtown businesses and property owners that come together to invest in the downtown improvement district, the business support of Super Bowl 52, the NCAA Final Four, the River First Initiative, or the downtown East Commons. It is also true that it is still too difficult to do business here. Two years ago, I launched Business Made Simple in order to make it easier for anyone to start and to run their businesses in the city of Minneapolis. And we've made good progress in that time. As of today, we've repealed about three dozen anachronistic ordinances that got in the way of creating successful businesses in Minneapolis. One required a license to operate a jukebox. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure that your very own jukebox is in the phone in your pocket right now. Special thanks to Councilmember Andrew Johnson for his persistent focus on stripping away these cumbersome and outdated ordinances. Thank you very much. <laughs> We
We've made significant investment in our new enterprise land management system that will increase the ability of city departments to review and approve requests and applications faster than ever before. And we are developing a new online portal that in 2017 will allow businesses to apply for and renew permits online, submit plans electronically, and better track the approval process. And I've also challenged the city's innovation team, funded by Bloomberg Philanthropies, thank you Bloomberg, to focus on how we can help increase businesses ownership in business ownership in communities of color. In a city that is nearing 50% people of color, only 23% of small businesses are owned by people of color. Yet we know there's a great entrepreneurial vitality in these communities that is ready to be unleashed. In addition, our Community Planning and Economic Development Department, led by Craig Taylor, continues to provide needed technical assistance to small and mid-sized businesses, primarily ones owned by people of color, through the Business Technical Assistance Program, BTAP. Last month, CPED added the new Cooperative Technical Assisted Program, CTAP, to our business development toolbox, and it will offer assistance to groups who are interested in forming new co-ops in the city of Minneapolis. In addition to this work to help small businesses thrive, I have convened, with the help of U.S. Bank CEO Richard Davis, what we call the Mayor's Business Leadership Roundtable, a group of leaders from some of the most well-known <coughs> corporations in Minneapolis and the region, in order to make sure that I can draw on a wide range of business perspectives. I appreciate their willingness to offer their candid experience and advice. Archie Black, CEO of SPS Communications, who is here with us today, is one of the members of the roundtable, and thank you, Archie, for that participation. This is one aspect of One Minneapolis in practice, and it is represented so well here on the stage. Small business, labor, corporations, advocates, social enterprise, and nonprofits, who in some context strain to come together, are all contributing to the well-being, vitality, and prosperity of our city. Thank you. Thank you to everybody doing that work. It is true, as we think about jobs and employment, that our vibrant, diverse economy makes Minneapolis a top big city job market. Our unemployment rate is just 3.5%, far below the national average. And in some good news for our immigrant community, 75% of foreign-born residents of the region are working, ranking us tops among competitor regions. It is also true that we suffer from huge racial disparities in employment. The unemployment rate for African Americans in Minneapolis is higher by about a factor of four. Jobs are harder to come by and harder to keep for low-income people who in Minneapolis are also disproportionately people of color. We have been warned over and over again by everybody, racial equity advocates to academics to corporate CEOs, that if we do not close our race-based gaps in skills and employment, our thriving economy will stall then decline. We cannot say that we do not know. We must take action, and we are. Patrick Chu is a Loring Park resident. He had been working in the mortgage servicing industry when he decided to make a career change. He had wanted to learn software development for some time and found that the 12-week immersive web development course at the Software Guild, a tech hire partner, was a better fit for him than going back to college for a computer science degree. With the help of the Software Guild's employer network, Patrick is now interning with General Mills as an application developer. Patrick and another tech hire graduate, Chelsea Obey are here with me today. Congratulations to you both. You might want to wave. Say hi, thanks. <laughs> tech Hire is an Obama administration initiative to close the skills gap in the high tech economy by training and supporting women and workers of color. It is one of the great ways we have to come, it's one of the great ways that we have come together as a community to transform our job market. Our investment in it is paying off. As of February, 201 graduates have been placed in full-time jobs that pay very well. I was also pleased to work with Councilmember Abdi Warsami to fund the Cedar Riverside Opportunity Hub in this year's budget. I appreciate his commitment to closing the skills gap and seeing young men and women of color getting good jobs through career pathways and other employment programs that are geared especially to the East African community. In my State of the City address last year, I proposed a working families agenda that included earned sick and safe time for workers in Minneapolis. And I proposed this in part as a public health measure. 42% of all Minneapolis workers lack access to paid time off to care for